I want to introduce our next guest. Um, the guest speaker, um, I met her when I was in college many, many years ago. The first time, I guess, because I'm back in again. But, um, and uh, yeah, really, really thought about it. You know, I was like, oh, what, what else can I do to put something into this uh, uh, spring festival? Aside from the extra noise, um, what else can I put into the spring f festival? Yeah, that wouldn't actually just be noise. That would be a, um, something that would bless this church, bless the people in this community. Um, and I immediately thought of my friend Bonnie. Um, we uh, go way back, uh, like I said, to college. So uh, it's a <laughs> OK. Well, it's not that long, I guess. But it seems like a long time ago, because the community we were able to build there, and um, well, God really built it, honestly. Um, it was something very unique something that I, I brag about to this day, um, and I appreciate to this day, something that I don't know where I would be if uh, we didn't have that. It's, just, it's rare for a, a group of college kids to do what, what we were able to do, um, to have the community that we were able to have. Um, so she's one of the people that I respect, one of the many people that I respect from that time in my life, and I'm so glad that she lives close enough to be able to have, um, bless us right now um, with, with the word from God. So um, without further ado, Bonnie Lewis. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And like Ed said, we go way back and he's such a dear friend. So I was honored that he asked me to come, and I'm honored to be here with you guys. Um, okay, so, um, you know, my mom's in town. She's right here. I know, hi mom, she's from Denver. And um, we have, I also have with my husband, we have a six-year-old son, and then we just brought home um, our baby girl, and she's now three months. So we have two kids, and we're kind of packing up, and we're, uh, we're moving, so we're packing boxes and we're doing all these crazy things and we're trying to entertain the six-year-old. And um, I was reminiscing on things that my parents did for me as a kid. And I thought about this one time, we were in Wichita, we were in Kansas, and my mom's family lives in Wichita, so we were there. And I decided that I wanted my dad to drive me to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I wanted to see the hometown of my favorite band at the time, which was Hanson. I don't know if you, you know that song, Mbop. I loved them, still kind of do. And um, so my dad, like no questions asked, just got in the car and we drove eight hours to Tulsa. And then I was too scared to do anything. And then he just drove me eight hours back. And it was like, he didn't even ask. And at the time I just thought, oh, that was a crazy thing to do. But now I realize that he just wanted to spend time with me. He just wanted eight hours of solid time with me. And that's, love makes us do that kind of thing. When we love someone, we invest in a relationship with them. And the truth is, is that when I was talking to Ed about what it is as a congregation that you guys were going through and what you're facing, he was telling me that um, this season, you're really gonna start to be a part of your community and to work in your community and to do things in your com community to bring the love of Jesus. And um, I love that. And it's something that really hit home with me because we are made in the image of God. That's what Genesis 1 tells us. But that means that we're made in the image of the triune God, right? So there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so from the get-go, we were made for community. That's just how we are. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they commune together. They do this beautiful dance. They each have their own roles. And we are made like them. We're each uniquely made, and we each need to work together. And so the nature of relationships and the nature of healing relationships is what God is all about. And the best way that we can learn how to do that well, how to be in relationships well, is to look at the disciples. So I know there's Bibles in your pew, so if you want to follow along, we're going to be reading out of Matthew 4, 18 through 22. And this is when Jesus called the first disciples, and he says that, and it says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, 
Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. So in this scene, we see that Jesus is calling these disciples, and they were fishermen. And contrary to popular belief, I think sometimes we think that the fishermen were actually very poor and not well off, so it wasn't much of a sacrifice for them to leave their jobs. But that's not actually true. It was actually a very lucrative business. And in um, this time that it was written, there was fishing was huge. It was huge for the economy. So Jesus was actually telling them, I need you to leave what you're doing, and I need you to come and follow me. The text doesn't tell us to what extent they left their jobs. We don't know if they just left it at that moment, which is what it says, or if they left them forever. But the overarching idea is that Jesus is asking them, come and follow me, and this will be an upheaval of your daily routine. We want you to get out of your comfort zone, and you're no longer going to do what you do every day. Instead, you're going to follow me. And that is true for us. That's the first lesson we can learn from the disciples. The call of Jesus doesn't wait for us to ch change our lifestyle. <clears throat> it interrupts it. He doesn't come and he doesn't care what we do for a job or a living as long as we are following him right in the middle of it. When Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men, it's actually an echo from Jeremiah 16, 16. And in that verse, it says that they want to catch men, but it's referencing catching men for judgment. But the difference is that Jesus is someone who cares for us. He saves us. And so he's actually catching men to save them from judgment. And so the second lesson that we can learn from the disciples is that our goal is always to save people. Our goal is to always to bring them to Jesus so that they will meet him and they can be redeemed by him. But in order for our community relationships and when we're reaching out to members of our community to look like that of Jesus, I believe that the model of these things and the way that we go about these transformative relationships must be three things. They must be intentional, they must be sustainable, and they must solve systematic solutions. And what I mean by that is, um, first of all, for intentional. We have a choice of who we serve and how we serve. And we're at our best when we pray about those things and we're intentional about the relationships that we form. And the reason why is that each of us, like we said before, is very uniquely gifted. So there's one thing that only you can do that no one else in the congregation can do just like you. And the same is true for everybody. And so if we're serving out of that place, we're gonna bring joy and we're gonna bring hope. And what that does is that shows people the face of Jesus. So when we're intentional to people and to relationships, we're mirroring the way that Jesus is intentional to us. Everything he does for us is by design. Nothing is left by mistake or by chance. He's very intentional in the way he loves us and in the way he meets us. So when we do that to others, we are mirroring who Jesus is. The second way that we want to always reach out um, is making sure that our efforts are sustainable. And what I mean by that is that we want to reach out to people and have, build relationships with people that are long-lasting, that go through a season. Our goal isn't to just show up once and to um, serve for a day, but our goal is to actually build a relationship that models that of Jesus and his church. And when Jesus calls someone his own and people come to him, they are there for good. Jesus' relationship with his people is always sustainable. It's always growing. It's always being nurtured. And so our relationships with each other and with the community also need to model that. And finally, everything we do um, in terms of community involvement should solve systematic issues. So there are certain things. When I worked for Food for the Hungry for a while, um, we had this program, and it was child sponsorship. In the child sponsorship program, you could um, sponsor a child each month for about $30, and then you would get an update about them. But it was actually part of a wider program. And what Food for the Hungry as a um, nonprofit did is they would go into third world countries, and they would sort of set up a plan. They would set up in a community, and they would say, we're going to do these 12 different things, 
But the unique thing about Food for the Hungry is that they always had an exit plan. So they said, we're going to come in here and we're going to work with this community. But what we're going to do is we're going to teach them. We're going to teach them how to stand on their own. And in 10 years, they're not going to need us anymore. And so what they did by that is they would teach them to grow their own crops. They would teach them to manage money. They would teach them all of these different skills they needed. And so over time, they were solving the problems from their roots. They were taking care of it from their roots. And so in 10 years, the, the community could stand on their own two feet. And that's what Jesus does to us, right? He brings us hope and he brings us joy. But he does that because he's solved the systematic issue of sin. So he has solved that. And that's what we need to bring to all of our relationships too, is we want to find solutions and we want to give solutions to people that restore dignity, that bring hope, because they're able to stand on their own two feet at some point. Later in Matthew 28, the call for all of us is to go and make disciples of all nations. And that's our call today too. But what's so unique about that is there are some of us who are called to literally go to different nations and make disciples. But for most of us, the call to make disciples happens right in our own communities. It happens with people that we're already in relationship with. And it happens with people all around us. And so Jesus told the first 12, I want you to go and make disciples. And so each one of them went and made a disciple, who then made a disciple, who then made a disciple. And now here we are talking about the transformation of relationships that Jesus brings. So it starts with each one of us investing in a relationship and making a disciple. And then that person will make a disciple. And that person will make a disciple. And pretty soon, all of Westminster will be disciples of Jesus. But it's one at a time. It's one relationship at a time. And it's all of us digging in and loving and caring and bringing the transformational love of Jesus to those relationships. So um, I'm just going to take a minute and I'm just going to pray over this next season for your church, if you'll join with me. Jesus, thank you so much for this um, wonderful congregation. Thank you for their heart to serve and love their neighbors. God, we just ask that you would be, um, be present in their talks and in their plans and um, in their hands and their feet as they go and love the community. I pray that each and every one of these people would just be a mirror of how you love your people, that they would show your face, that they would show your hands and your feet to these to these amazing, amazing neighbors that you have already set in front of them. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we thank you that you know your plan for this city, and we thank you that your work is not done here yet, and that we get to be a part of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.